Good evening and welcome to this webinar on uh, economic inequality, impact on social justice. Um, on behalf of uh, Indian Social Institute and Christian Institute for the Study of Religion and Society, Scissors, uh, we welcome you for this uh, webinar on the eve of the World Day of uh, Social Justice. And uh, to begin, we shall have uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Y.T. Vineraj, who will give his welcome address. Uh, Dr. Vineraj is the new director of Christian Institute for the Study of Religion and Society. Reverend Vineraj is an ordained of the Marthoma Church. He started his ecumenical journey in the student Christian Reverend Dr. Vinay Raj taught at many theological seminaries and he is a prolific writer. His areas of interest are Dalit theology, ecumenical theology, political philosophy. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Vinay Raj, for your words of welcome and introduction. Thank you, Dr. Denzel Fernandez. Dear friends, Christian Institute for the Study of Religion and Society, CISRS, and uh, Indian Social Institute, ISI Delhi, are really privileged to organize this webinar on the theme Economic Inequality, Impact on Social Justice, especially in connection with the United Nations World Day of Social Justice. United Nations World Day of Social Justice is a reminder to all of us to take effective measures to stop economic inequality that kills our society. The recent report of uh, Oxfam India entitled Inequality Kills defines inequality as the death sentence for the marginalized people. The report identifies the role of the liberal economic policies and projects that legitimize this economic emergency in global setting, especially in India. The report also points out that the stark reality of economic inequality worsened by the COVID pandemic in global setting. The report says that the wealth of Indian millionaires is increased by 35% during this lockdown. And at the same time, 40 crore informal workers have fallen into uh, poverty and uh, you know, miserable life situations. The report argues for sustained and immediate action in terms of public policies and welfare projects to end uh, this economic emergency. CISRS and uh, ISI Delhi organized this webinar, webinar as an occasion to disseminate the report of Oxfam India and reflect on its implications to people uh, within our sphere of influence. We have the Chief uh, Executive Officer of Oxfam India, Mr. Amida Bahar, is with us today this evening to talk to us on uh, economic inequality impact on social justice based on their report entitled Economy uh, 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 Inequality, Inequality Kills. Mr. Amida Bahar is a global civil society leader and an authority on tackling economic and gender inequality and uh, building citizen participation. Mr. Bahar currently serves as the vice chair of the Board of Civicus, a global alliance of civil society organizations and activists dedicated to strengthening citizen action and civil society across the globe. 
He also serves on the boards of several other organizations, including the Center for Budget and Governance Accountability, an Indian public policy think tank. Prior to Oxfam, Ms. Bahar was the executive director of National Foundation for India and served as the convener of National Social Watch Coalition and the co-chair of Global Call to Action Against Poverty, a network of over 11,000 civil society organizations. We are really privileged and honored to have Mr. Amitabh Bahar with us today this evening. A very warm welcome to Amitabh Bahar to this webinar. Dr. Denzel Fernandez is the moderator of this webinar. Dr. Denzel is the executive director of the Indian Social Institute, Nudalhi, a close associate of CISES in its daily activities. Dr. Denzel is the co-host of this program and being a, a scholar and social research fellow, uh, he is the right person to be the moderator uh, of this session. A warm welcome to Denzel Fernandez. A special word of uh, uh, welcome to Dr. Archana Sinha, uh, a research, uh, senior research fellow and uh, assistant research director at ISI. And she is going to be the coordinator of this webinar. Welcome Dr. Archana Sinha to this meeting. On behalf of CISERS and ISI Delhi, let me extend a warm welcome to all our friends and well wishes for being with us this evening. I do acknowledge the friends and well wishes of uh, 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 CISERS and IS, ISI uh, uh, with us this evening, especially let me acknowledge the presence of uh, Reverend Dr. Vincent Dashkumar, former director of uh, CISERS, uh, Dr. Limala, uh, Dean of uh, uh, Satri, Senate of Sarambur University, our uh, Theological Fraternity, Ecumenical and Secular Fraternity, friends, well wishes of both CISES and ISI. A warm welcome to all. Let it be a meaningful evening of deliberation and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Densil. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Dr. Vinay Raj, for your generous words of welcome and introducing us to this uh, webinar. Um, we have with us uh, Mr. Amitabh Behar, uh, the CEO of uh, Oxfam. And uh, uh, we all know we are here in the context of the uh, World Day of Social Justice being celebrated, as well as the inequality report, uh, inequality kills that uh, Oxfam uh, released uh, about a month ago, uh, which really revealed the underbelly of uh, the Indian situation, especially during these uh, times. Uh, Oxfam has been at the forefront of trying to uh, research inequality and discrimination against women and marginalized groups uh, throughout the country. And uh, this report is part of the many um, research initiatives and engagements of Oxfam. Uh, in particular, uh, Oxfam uh, was at the forefront of COVID relief uh, throughout the country and uh, reached out to uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, all over the country, especially when they were in need. Um, so uh, it, it was a tremendous work that uh, Oxfam did. But at the same time, we are also uh, here to express solidarity uh, Oxfam. Indian Social Institute, as well as uh, Christian Institute for the Study of Religion and Society, Scissors, express solidarity with uh, Mr. Amitabh Behar and Oxfam India, especially in the context of 
the non-renewal of their FCRA, and we hope that better sense will prevail and uh, the matters will be resolved. With these uh, wishes, uh, I um, uh, hand over to uh, Mr. Amitabh Bahar to address us on uh, in economic inequality, impact social justice. So, um, thank you, thank you, Denzil, and thank you, Vineraji. It is really my privilege to be here, and uh, I'm very, very grateful for both uh, inviting me here and also for, uh, I would say, picking this topic, uh, particularly on the eve of the Social Justice Day. So, thank you for doing this, but uh, let me also express my deep sense of gratitude uh, for the solidarity, Denzil, and many of the friends here have reached out even earlier in the last few weeks and have expressed their solidarity. It does mean a lot. These are extremely difficult times for uh, civil society and particularly now for Oxfam India. And uh, I, I think that solidarity has meant a lot to us. It's given us uh, inspiration. It's given us hope. But it is quite ironic uh, that an entity which has been in India since 1951, we've done 70 years in India, uh, cannot receive foreign resources. It is an entity that uh, in the last one and a half years, we have done oxygen plants, almost 10 oxygen plants. Each plant uh, serves 100 beds in government hospitals thousands of oxygen cylinders, BiPAP machines, it just goes on. Um, but, but still, um, the current regime felt that we were not working in public interest. Uh, so I just wanted to you know, really say a big thank you for uh, your solidarity. So you know, if I could just uh, move on, um, you know, the whole question of uh, social justice and inequalities. So I, I'm very happy if, if I could request Pass. colleagues to mute their line. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's been mute muted. the line. Yeah. It's been muted, yes. So, you know, I just wanted to say that uh, it is an important question that economic inequality and social justice are linked. And I really hope that we can have a conversation today but also continue this discussion on what is growing inequality, why is it growing, how can we address it, and what is the larger impact of, of uh, uh, growing economic inequality, particularly on questions of, of, of social justice. So let, let me just start with <clears throat> this, the most sacred document uh, for me, which is the Indian constitution. And as we know that in the Indian constitution, there are four fundamental pillars, as in if you look at the preamble, and we keep talking about it, but I just wanted to center stage those four pillars once again, which are essentially <clears throat> freedom, equality, fraternity, and justice. And, and, and as uh, you know, a group of this kind obviously knows that the first three pillars have been pillars of democracy around the world. But I think the unique contribution of, of the Indian Republic is that it puts justice into the center of the, the imagination of the new, new Republic. So I just wanted to also bring that up. And, and it is a powerful, uh, you know, that preamble. Every time I read it, it's, it's on my office desk. But every time I read it, I still get goosebumps in, in, in terms of the aspiration of what this Republic wants. And this is not just the fundamental pillar, as we know that e uh, economic equality is also in the directive principles in terms of Article 39, which broadly talks of how do you move towards economic uh, uh, equality. And at this level, uh, at this moment, let me just you know remind us of a particular quote from uh, Dr. Ambedkar, because I think this is really a, a critical one. He said, um, how long shall we continue to live the life of contradictions? How long shall we continue to deny equality in our social and 
economic life. If we continue to deny it for long, we will do so only by putting our political democracy in peril. That's, that's uh, Dr. Ambedkar. And I think this is something that we're looking at and we need to kind of acknowledge and, and, and work this. Uh, then let me just, you know, move from the constitution and straight away cut 70 years and move to the COVID times. I just want to, you know, uh, remind us of a couple of visuals. And those two visuals, uh, I, I'm sure we've all experienced it. We have seen it in different ways, but they are, they're powerful, heart-wrenching. And those two visuals that I want to talk of, one is the 21 April, May, as in, I certainly did see, and I'm sure pretty much everyone here would have seen their own friends, family members, extended community, literally dying either on the streets or waiting for oxygen on the uh, hos hospital receptions. That's, that's what we were seeing during COVID second wave. Extremely heart-wrenching, but, but we have all experienced it. The country was literally gasping for oxygen. This is one. The second that I wanted to remind us, which, which visually we have again seen thousands of uh, thousands of our brothers and sisters who we call as migrant workers, who essentially make the cities that we live in, <clears throat> were forced to leave those cities. And they were walking bare feet often without food or water, uh, walking back to their source villages, thousands of kilometers uh, when the temperature was 41, 42 degree. And they had to also still face uh, uh, the, the police, which was often using the cane lattes to stop them from walking on the roads. And they just wanted to go back to safety to their villages. That's another scene that, you know, visually I just wanted us to, uh, uh, to remember. In this context, you know, with, with these visuals and the background of what we have from the Indian constitution, uh, what Dr. Ambedkar said. Let me just now share what our report says. And Vinay Ji has already talked a few of those, those uh, uh, data points, but I still want to talk of a few more because uh, I think it's, it's uh, important to understand the extent of, of the inequality we are seeing. As the report essentially is saying, as Vinay Ji said, that the inequality has reached obscene levels. It has particularly exploded during the COVID times. And uh, the way it has exploded, it will have a huge adverse impact on society, economy, and quality. It's not just the economy. And, and we also are uh, talking about, you know, the, this level of uh, obscene inequality is essentially killing the most marginalized. So let me just give you a few data points. It, and this is during the pandemic year, the one, one and a half years of the pandemic. So the data that we have is till November 21, starting from March 20. That's, that's the, the data that, that we're looking at. During this, let me first start with um, Indian data. And, and, and I'll not talk of too many uh, data points. In India, we saw the rise of billionaires from 102 we became 142 billionaires just during this one and a half years. And that's the time, I think it's important to juxtapose it. That's the time when 84% of the Indian population actually saw a decline in their incomes. So on the one hand, you have a 40% rise in billionaires. On the other hand, you have 84% population uh, having witnessed a decline in their income. The second, I, you know, I, I think which is uh, important, the, the combined wealth of the billionaires during this time, during again the same pandemic period, doubled. And this is the time <clears throat> when there are different studies, uh, as Vineraji was saying that ILO actually had predicted uh, last year that almost 40 crore will go below poverty line. Uh, but this year from an <clears throat> Azim Premji University study, which talks of 4.2 people actually going below uh, 
poverty line to pure research, which says almost 16 crore uh, went below poverty line. So people have slided below the poverty line. The hard work done over the last 10, 15, 20 years of, of trying to bring people out of poverty has, has gone away. <clears throat> so, so, you know, pretty much experts agree that what we are seeing during the pandemic is the steepest rise of inequality globally and also in India. And this is the time where most of the people are actually finding getting food to the table extremely difficult. So, so that, that's you know, some hard big numbers for us. Let me just also say that this is a global phenomenon. Globally, the top 10 billionaires have doubled their wealth again during this period. You know, and then the, the, the next one is absolutely startling because when, when I had not seen it, I just couldn't believe it, uh, that uh, the top 2,660 billionaires actually uh, have the wealth equivalent to GDP of China. That's, you know, and, and we know how, how well China is, is doing. That's what the concentration of wealth has done. Just 2,660 people more wealth uh, or, or equivalent wealth to the GDP of China. And, and you know, this. Let, let me just also say that if you start looking at uh, other ways of, of wealth distribution, the top 10% have 45% of, of Indian wealth and bottom 50% of this country have only 6% of Indian wealth. You know, I'm just giving you different data points to, to help us understand uh, both, I would say, the urgency and the obscenity of this level of inequality that we are seeing. In, in, in fact, I, you know, I must also say that uh, we do get critiqued a lot of times uh, that we are essentially talking about wealth distribution and inequality in wealth. But uh, at least I am happy that a couple of months ago, now we have also the data from the inequality um, center, which does now the income inequality report and where the trend is pretty much the same. So there's a complete overlap between what we are saying as wealth inequality. They're also talking now of income inequality. And, and let me just say that it's, it's not just uh, uh, some bleeding hearts, some people who are critical of us, uh, as I, I, I find it offensive, but uh, I still you know, would want to say that it's not just us. Somebody like Thomas Piketty, who's an extremely celebrated economist, and many of you would have uh, uh, read his book. Uh, now he's done two books on, on inequality, looks particularly at India also. He's saying with hard data <clears throat> that the levels of inequality in India are higher than what it was in 1935. And I think it's, it's a very important point he makes because after 1935, there's not enough data, so he's not been able to analyze. But what he says is post 40s, post, yeah, sorry, post 47 after independence, income inequality, wealth inequality did drop. There was a decline in that inequality from 50s to the early 90s. However, we, the, the policy choices we made in the 90s, which is essentially uh, liberalization, the neoliberal policy, we have again moved towards an unequal society. And, and this has now reached levels higher than pre-independence. And let's juxtapose this fact with uh, the aspiration, the fundamental aspiration of Indian constitution to build an equal uh, society. You know, I just also wanted to further say that I talked of the early 90s and, and uh, people would remember that the big proponents of, uh, of uh, the structural adjustment program happening around the world, uh, in India, the economic liberalization, two entities of, which come to our mind uh, are the IMF and the World Bank. And interestingly, even they are now saying that these levels of inequalities are not sustainable. So you, you can really go back to the World Bank and IMF now. It sounds bizarre, 
but they're saying that the policies that they actually themselves pushed are disruptive. And now you're looking at uh, the IMF chief last year said that you would be creating conditions for social and political unrest, the collapse of social and political systems with these levels of inequality, and we'll not be able to sustain. So, you know, I, I really think that you know many of us are constantly reminding others about the climate catastrophe. This is also a huge explosive situation that we are in. And, and the, you know, today it's not our, our discussion, but we should really someday, and, and maybe some of you who work on, on democracy should talk about how uh, authoritarian regimes and the huge threats to democracy are part of this larger uh, e income inequality that we have created around the world and also in, in our country. So, you know, I, I, I just wanted to also because I think it's been said very well, and I'm trying to give you a flavor of the different people working on, on this question. I just wanted to straight uh, pick a, a statement, quote it for you, because it's, it's powerfully said by the UN Secretary General, the current uh, uh, UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. He says, uh, he talks about COVID. COVID-19 has been likened to an X-ray revealing fractures in the fragile skeleton of the societies we have built. It is exposing fallacies and falsehoods everywhere. The lie that free markets can deliver healthcare for all, the fiction that unpaid care work is not work, the delusion that we live in a post-racist society, the myth that we are all in the same boat. I think this is a particularly important line for, for me. The, the myth that we are all in the same boat while we are all floating on the same sea. It is clear that some are in super yachts while others are clinging to the drifting debris. That's, that's the UN Secretary General. So, you know, there, there's, I'm trying to just bring out that there is at least an appreciation and understanding in the thinking world that this is unacceptable. But sadly, Tragically, I don't see the reflection of this in the policy choices we are making, certainly not, not in India. You know, let me just give you now what I think is very critical about uh, linking the inequality to social justice is the fact that certainly again in India, and, and this is I think a story uh, which is global, we must acknowledge that inequality is not just income inequality. There are multiple layers of inequality and there are also intersectionality in terms of inequality. And let me just give you that, that flavor, <clears throat> which is so important for us eventually when we'll, we'll think of a design uh, for our interventions to ensure uh, justice and equality. Let me just remind us that the 2011, and we've not done the census in 2021, <clears throat> the data told us that for all thousand boys at, in the zero to six category, there are only 916 girls, which essentially means that for every thousand, we are missing around 84 girls. You know, it's, 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 it's dramatic. Uh, and uh, Amartya Sen has written about it, and he talks of the missing millions. These are girls who have not been allowed to be born, which is essentially about sex selective abortion that's, that's led to this declining child sex ratio. And it is very clear that this is about patriarchy. Uh, and, and you need to just look at the data, particularly where it is concentrated. It is concentrated in the areas where there's greater economic wealth. Uh, the, the declining child sex ratio. So it's, it's interesting. The poorest part have better sex ratios even now. And the places where, in fact, there's a study which I think is fascinating, where we got cash crops early. Uh, that's where you have seen the, the, the sex ratio go down dramatically. Second, this is a personal experience, but I, you know, I, I, it's a powerful one. Once uh, I was in, uh, uh, in uh, Parbani, uh, and I was there for the drought uh, uh, relief work. It was a tough day. 
you actually saw I met people, women who were walking several kilometers. As I, I'm sure, again, a group of this kind will know, probably know it much better than me, uh, walking several kilometers to just just fetch water for the family. And and uh, then I, I drove back at the end of the day <clears throat> and I happened to speak to P. Sainath, uh, who I'm sure everyone knows, the, uh, the famous journalist. And P. Sainath said, oh, please don't sleep in the car. Keep looking at the billboards uh, when you're driving towards the Bombay airport. And I did that. And it was devastating uh, evening for me. Coming from that water poverty that I'd seen, Every five kilometers, there was this billboard advertising a multi storied building with a personal swimming pool in every flat. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of inequality in terms of access to natural resources uh, that one could look at. And, and not to mention, uh, which, which I, I don't, you know, but, but I never fail to mention that you, I, when you're eventually going towards the Mumbai airport from the fort area, you also uh, see this house, which to my mind is also an ugly house built for the most, the richest person in this country. I am sure you would have seen it. I don't know how many of you would find it aesthetically beautiful, but I think it's obscene that in the middle of, of, of uh, uh, Mumbai, where uh, probably just within two kilometers, three kilometers, there would be lakhs of people living in informal settlements and you had the most expensive house of the world. At one point, uh, point of time, it was the most expensive house uh, uh, for four people uh, around that, that level of, of poverty. And there's some lovely visuals, stark visuals, lovely as in, uh, it'll make you angry, but have a look at those visuals where you see the Antilla on the one side, and, and the informal settlements uh, around that. You know, just, just to keep going, I, you know, because I want to bring the different dimensions of inequality, because for social justice, that, that's critical. Let, let me just you know, talk of the rural urban uh, uh, difference. According to the UN report, and I'm not going with the Government of India report, which anyways talks of uh, we have achieved uh, uh, total sanitation. Uh, the UN report says that in urban areas, 90% of the population has uh, access to improved sanitation. Whereas in rural areas, it's only 39%. So that's the rural urban uh, uh, inequality. People who work on education will know that if you just look at say the, the literacy rate for upper caste men and Adivasi women, the difference is gonna be almost 20 to 30 points. Uh, I'm fairly sure, I've not looked at the data right now, uh, but that would be the level of, of difference. Many of us here work with uh, the Safai Karamchari Andolan. In 2017, they came out with this report that every 15 days, there were 10 people dying just in the national capital region, uh, cleaning uh, the sewage lines. Uh, you know, and then that's important because they were all from one particular Dalit community. So I just also wanted to bring in, and if you start looking at the caste data, there'll be there'll be so much of inequality uh, that that you'll find. As in, we as Oxfam, uh, we are not deterred by by the decisions of the government in terms of what we need to do. We're going to come out with uh, an, a discrimination report in, in uh, uh, on Ambedkar's uh, uh, birthday later this, this year. On the climate bit, you know, just very quickly, one piece of the climate is, um, this is from the carbon inequality report that Oxfam did last year. The top 1% are responsible for double the carbon emissions of the 50% of the global population. Just, just imagine top 1% are responsible for double the emissions of 50% of the global population. That's the level of inequality. And we know, as I, I, since I joined Oxfam, I've been working on natural disasters. We can directly see the impact of climate change. It's, it's not now that it's gonna happen somewhere in the future. You're seeing the number of climate disasters happen uh, and the frequency, the ferocity and the frequency is, is uh, increasing. 
So, you know, why is all this happening? This is clearly a rigged economic system, which is ensuring that the profits get uh, accumulated at the top and the others do not get access to those resources. I think that's, that's the bottom line. There are different ways of doing it. Uh, one of the big things, uh, you know, which we work on, which is very depressing is that globally, again, data tells us that health and education are two important drivers of equality. They create equal society. So wherever there's more, greater equality, we've seen education and health as a very, very important uh, policy intervention by the state. And in our country, what we have seen is a systematic uh, uh, undernourishment of the health and the uh, education sector. And, and we also know that eventually with, with new billionaires coming even from edtech, uh, you're also seeing how health and education are being privatized. So I'll, I'll talk a little about, you know, particularly health, because, uh, so uh, Denzel, should I take five more minutes? Is that okay? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. You okay. please, yeah, please yeah. go. But, but do tell me if you think I've yeah. spoken no, no, beyond no, no. my yeah. Yeah. So, so this has been the COVID year and, and our uh, report uh, in, in the India Inequality Report on Health, which we did in uh, May or June last year, I think it's is again highlighting some very, very important points. Uh, let me first give you a sense of the, you know, on, on the one hand, we have been still continuing with this India shining narrative. The phrase has changed, but it is essentially the, uh, the, the same narrative. We want to maintain that, that global narrative. Uh, but let me just give you three or four, three specific data points on, on the health system. Uh, in India, we have only 0 0.6 doctors for per thousand, whereas the global norm is one per thousand. You know, so we're we uh, missing 0 0.4, 40% uh, is the shortfall that we're looking at. So that's with the doctors. Amongst nurses, the shortfall is 43%. And this is what we're looking at, the health infrastructure. Obviously, you know, however hard our doctors and nurses, the paramedics work during COVID, it had to collapse with this level of, of, of poverty of, of uh, resources. And then the third, which I think is a very important one, I want to particularly highlight uh, that uh, the, the number of beds, the WHO norm says that there should be five beds per thousand population. In India, it is five beds per 10,000 population. That's, that's the level of difference. And, and why I think is, it's very critical is because we have actually seen in a reduction in the number of beds over the last five, seven years. So the, you know, that trend is something that we need to pick that you're actually looking at uh, uh, the health infrastructure becoming weaker than what we had uh, a few years ago, certainly on, on this aspect. And uh, we are uh, in the list of the uh, uh, beds per thousand uh, indicator. We are 155th of 167 countries. And, and again, all of you know those indicators are, are huge reminders of for us, wake up calls for us, but we never take them. And you know, while this has happened, we have also looked at uh, how last year during COVID, the budget, the health budget was actually cut by 10%. This is the policy, you know, lack of policy intervention or complete apathy to, uh, uh, I would say any, E equality inducing policy is uh, shown uh, by the government. Let me just talk of one more on, of the health data. And I think it's, it's, this is a, a very important one. Uh, you know, a lot of health experts use this data that out of pocket expenses, uh, the, the people who have to pay from their pocket when they have a illness, in India, in uh, private hospitals, it's six times more 
uh, or rather private hospitals, private provisioning, it's six times more than the government provisioning. And still we are starving the public health system. And the second is absolutely startling. The global average of out-of-pocket expenditure is only 18.12%. And can anybody take a guess who has not read this figure? What is the out-of-pocket expenditure percentage in India? You know, it's not interactive, but otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm sure unlikely that people would have uh, imagined in India it's 62%. Global average is 18% and in India it's 62%. Let me just round this off with the fact, and we know that we have all read that, we have experienced it in our work with communities. One illness in the family leads to uh, people sliding, families sliding into poverty traps below poverty line. So that's, that's about uh, uh, looking at health. What can we do? You know, three, four things, and then and I'll, I'll stop with that. One, uh, we are seeing another worrying trend in the last few years is that our reliance on direct taxation has actually increased. Uh, oh, sorry, in, in indirect taxation has, has increased, which uh, as you know, everybody and the burden of this on the poor and vulnerable is greater. But, but we are going ahead with that. And actually we are doing away with uh, progressive direct taxation. So uh, some time back, we did away with the inheritance tax. Few years ago, we did away with the wealth tax. And we have also seen a reduction in the corporate taxes. Whereas on the other hand, you're constantly seeing surcharges. We've seen the fuel surcharge play a massive role this time. Uh, in terms of inflation and also the impact uh, on, on the poor. So the first prescription that we've been saying is the direct taxation, bring back wealth tax, inheritance tax. Again, just to give you one data, and, and these are startling data uh, points, one person surcharged on the wealth of the top 98 families, just one person surcharge will raise enough resources for the government to support the Ayushman Bharat, the ambitious Ayushman Bharat for seven years. They can actually do that with one percent surcharge and these families will still be richer than what, were, what they were, way richer than what they were before the pandemic. And still we don't take measures of, 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 of this kind. The second, I think, which is very critical, you know, while we're talking of the wealth tax, we also need to ensure that uh, the people pay their fair share of taxes. There's such huge amount of tax evasion that we see. We have seen recently in the Pandora paper how intergenerational tax evasion is, is uh, uh, happening through the trust. People who understand that uh, will know how we've done that. Many of the Indian uh, 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 super rich have done that. But ensuring fair, a fair share of taxes being paid by everyone. Uh, and, and this has been um, documented by just last year, the Tax Justice Network said that uh, governments lost 450 billion US dollars just by tax evasion. And pretty much every expert says that this is, uh, this is tip of the iceberg. It's gonna be much more. And this, this happens through multiple ways, including offshoring. The third, I think, which is critical and, and many of us work on it is, uh, ensuring minimum wages. But I would also say, at least in Oxfam, we have now been saying it's not about minimum wages, we need to ensure uh, uh, living wages. And when we say living wages, we are talking of to you know, broadly say that will ensure a life of dignity for the worker and the worker's family. So it's not just a, a, a minimum wage, but it's the living wage that we need to ask for. I've already talked of, which I think one of the biggest drivers is investment in education, in health, in social security. Uh, those are the other things that we need to uh, work on. And let me just end by saying, you know, it is possible. We've just seen Argentina last year come up with a wealth tax, 
one off wealth tax on its super wealthy, which gave them enough resources to address the uh, address the uh, uh, the COVID crisis. Uruguay has come up with a law on unpaid care work. On the other hand, you know, just the, uh, the gender inequality I was talking of, every year, uh, women lose wages of, you know, uh, it's 12.5 billion hours uh, is what is lost in terms of unpaid care work. And Uruguay now has uh, a, a specific law around that. It is essentially about how we're looking at the whole economic system, the capitalist system. Uh, and, and there are, you know, we keep talking of Bhutan because it's our neighbor, which is talking of the happiness index, which is moving away from GDP. New Zealand has started talking of, of um, uh, a well being index. So it's, it's not looking at just the GDP, it's looking at a well being index. So there are, you know, several measures being taken. I think we need to really wake up uh, and uh, address this inequality directly. Otherwise, we are looking at a very, very bleak future. Anyways, these are tough times, and this is really adding to it. And, and, and many of you can, I'm, I'm sure, comment that ultimately, these are different sides of the same coin. So thank you. That's, that's from me. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Amitabh, for um, unraveling to us the inequality uh, report, as well as all the indicators, as you have mentioned, especially during the COVID times, um, the amount of people who have gone back uh, to poverty, as well as the billionaires who have increased their fortunes. Uh, you also uh, spoke of uh, the, the economic policies that uh, have led to this uh, inequality and uh, also proposed, or, or uh, you, know, you have highlighted several measures that the, the government needs to take uh, as far as taxation is concerned, uh, surcharge on the rich, uh, ensuring minimum wages, uh, uh, living wages, as well as uh, social security. And uh, the most uh, important is the greater investment in health, education, and uh, social security. And the one thing uh, that uh, you mentioned, which really struck me, is that uh, health and education and uh, social security as well are drivers of uh, equality. So. Uh, so anyway, so I think uh, 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 you have really uh, captured the, the situation in the country and what, what needs to be done. Uh, there are, so now I shall, uh, there are some questions uh, in, the, in the chat. If, if, anyone, um, um, if anyone wants to directly question. Uh, uh, Denzel. Well, but uh, before that, I shall... Uh... Dr. Denzel, can I make a suggestion now? Yes, okay. Uh, Ranji University Vice Chancellor, Dr. Sona Jaria Mins is with us. Okay. Uh, if she wants to make a, a short response, kindly allow her to make that. Okay, okay. Dr. Sona? Uh, Dr. Sona Jaria Minj? She was a professor at uh, ANU. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, a correction, Vinayraj. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not at Ranchi University. I'm at Sidhu Kanu Murmu University. Murmu University. Sorry for that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Which is, which is uh, roughly 300 kilometers from Ranchi. So it's further yeah. interior uh, okay. than Ranchi. Yeah. Um, it's always a delight to listen to Amitabh. So I did uh, <laughs> make sure that late, better late than never, I did catch up with some listening to him. But I think uh, Amitabh has, has just packed us with all the data and inferences or observations which are pertinent to me. And I think I'll leave the, uh, the, the time to all the learned uh, other um, participants.
to pose some very thoughtful questions and we can deliberate on them. Uh, yeah, especially since, uh, you know, this these areas are not my, uh, they, they don't fall in the area of my professional training. So <clears throat> I, I, wouldn't, I would like to refrain from making comment now rather than I should be asking questions. Thank you so much okay. for recognizing. Thank you, Thank yeah. you Anur, uh, Amitabh. It was a pleasure listening to you. Yeah, um, I, I'll just, I, I'll, um, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sona and Jarya Minch. Nice to see you. Um, I would uh, take the question of Raj Mondal, who uh, says, you know, the stark inequalities uh, that are presented are both global and Indian, which will continue to grow in the coming years as per current trends, in the political and fiscal policies of uh, governments. Um, which present quite a dismal of the idea of social justice. What hopes do you have that this trend can be checked or reversed? Um, so this is one question. Um, the, so then yeah. you want me to... What else? Yeah. No, let me know. You, you want me to respond yeah, now? Okay, you, you, can, you can respond because... More questions, um, then others can ask. Yeah. Okay, so you know, first, just a big thank you, Sona, for uh, uh, coming, and it's so lovely to see you every time. Um, and and uh, it's been a long journey with you over the decades now. So thank you for for doing what you do. Uh, just just coming to this this question, uh, you know, what I would say is let 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 me be. Uh, positive. I do see that people are recognizing that this is totally unacceptable. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that even a hardcore free market proponents, as I said, IMF World, uh, World Bank are now strongly saying that these levels of uh, income inequality are not sustainable. Uh, so, I, you know, I would say that at least whether it will, you know, for us, it's important to ensure that the needle moves adequately to talk of questions of justice. And it is not just a little bit of adjustment, uh, but, but look at even the actions as in we also work with um, a group called Patriotic Millionaires. I'm, I'm sure you would have seen that because we got the front page uh, after our report uh, of all the national dailies, even for the letter that these Patriotic Millionaires of the US released. They are literally saying that please tax us more. We have not heard that voice in India, but they're saying that these levels of inequality are unacceptable and uh, we need to be taxed more. Warren Buffett, one of the richest persons in the world, actually said that this is ironic and, and uh, uh, a situation, odd situation that we've created that my secretary pays lower taxes than me. So in a way, what I'm saying is that there is recognition People are talking about it. Two years ago, I was in Davos uh, with these super rich releasing our, our report uh, uh, there. And uh, I thought it was interesting that they started talking of, many of them are saying that we cannot just talk of shareholder capitalism. We need to move to stakeholder capitalism. Yes, you can, you know, very often you know that these are just uh, rhetoric but there is at least that conversation happening. And on the other hand, you know, just one more piece. We do need to bring tremendous pressure on, our, on the government, our government, on, certainly on health and education, because I just want to give you one more piece of data. This is again stark. Um, we, we talked of the uh, health system, health infrastructure in this country. Every government over the last 20 to 30 years has said that we will ensure two to 3% of the GDP on the public health system. And we have hovered around 1.25 every year. We have not really gone beyond that, 1.25. And this in comparison with, I just wanted to give you the BRICS data. Brazil actually invests 9.2% of GDP on, on health. South Africa does 8.1. Russia does five. China does five. 
just imagine the the huge gap 1.25 and brazil which is a peer everywhere we are saying brics are our our peer countries that's 9.2 even bhutan uh, does 2.5 and sri lanka does 1.6 that's massive difference if you start looking at the entire gdp i think we need to push build pressure and ensure that now at least we are looking at health as one of the central questions uh you know I, I, if if you remember i loved the speech done by uh, the member of parliament uh, manoj jha where he said that now at least post pandemic we need to ensure uh, health is a right like education in this country so let's let's create momentum and yeah it's the challenges are huge at the moment the onslaught on the idea of democracy on the idea of freedom and justice is massive but i think the fight back is also going to be through these building blocks of a democratic and and uh, equal society uh, yeah uh, thank you uh, amitab there's there are questions one is uh, um, you know oxfam brought out a report on inequalities um, and uh, you know i don't want to mention the data uh, but oxfam also said that Uh, also factored in the caste dalit adivasi muslim uh, and women and uh, oxfam has uh, also uh, been factoring intersectionality or independent studies on religion state of christians uh, and so on so do you see the uh, so uh, do you see the, the state pandering into majoritarianism uh, this is one uh, thing and uh, the other point is that uh uh um growing inequality uh the restlessness of the youth rich indifferent uh could lead means it's almost it could lead to a civil war like situation do you agree uh with that so just a couple of questions before the others can come yeah so you know just to be uh specific in terms of our report uh, through the report we have we cannot say that the state is pandering to the the majoritarian politics uh, because the trend that we are looking at of growing inequality started from the early 90s and in terms of the economic architecture you have not seen, seen significant changes in the last 20 years you are pretty much seeing the same a uh, slide down which started in the uh, uh, early 90s but independent of the studies i i can certainly confidently say that yes we are looking at majoritarianism the threat of majoritarianism in this country i just wanted to but be very clear the report you know because these these the, the, it's based on hard research and it's not the domain of of the research of this report and the second question in terms of the uh unrest uh, particularly among the young people i think it's it's very important and that's what when imf and world bank talk of uh, of it will lead to social unrest is a reality that we are seeing in the uh, the last year uh, we have seen protest uh, massive civil society protest in several countries starting from colombia to hong kong to um, lebanon and many of them not the hong kong one so much but the other ones both were clearly around growing inequality in their countries and and they completely disrupted uh, civic life uh, uh, the national uh, life so this is a very eminent reality as in if if we are looking at the highest level of unemployment in the last 45 years with the kind of inequality that we are seeing it is it is a very worrying thought uh, and and we must address it uh, immediately um uh, thank you amitab uh, there is a question uh, which says that you know um you are a, a important face in in civil society and uh, a lot of faith communities like a lot of us uh, over here in uh, belong to various churches uh, uh, in in the country and also engaged in social services uh, so what uh, 
uh, what kind of response would you expect from uh, you know uh, the churches, the Christian community, and those working uh, in uh, providing social, educational, and health services in the country? Okay, so you know, so Denzel, I, you know, I, I'm I'm gonna not take this one. All of you represent such rich legacies uh, that it is not my place to uh, say anything to all of you. Uh, and I can only say that the phenomenal work, uh, I know many of you, so the phenomenal work you've done over the years, please continue that. You inspire thousands of people. And you know, at this moment, I do feel that the odds might be really against the ideas of, of justice, ideas of social justice, but we need to keep the, you know, two things, our moral compass intact and our spine straight. Those are two things. And, and many of you have done that exceptionally well. So continue, continue inspiring us, continue keeping the moral uh, compass of, of this country uh, intact. It's really a tough time. We all know that as in we keep talking about it. It is a tough time where the, the fundamentals of the Indian Republic are being threatened. And during that, it is people like you who, who have such deep commitment uh, uh, to a just society uh, who can continue the, you know, keeping the faith alive. And I'm sure we've seen history, uh, cycles change, and, and I'm sure there'll be people who will, who will uh, fight the good fight to ensure that India is a just, equal society. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Amitabh. There's a question. Uh, can you share some reflections on the agrarian situation in the country and in the future in the context of you know, the, the farmers' protests and so <clears throat> on? Yeah. So, you know, I, well, that's not uh, an area where, again, our report has dealt deeply into it. So, you know, I, I'll just make a couple of broad comments and more about the farmers' protest. Uh, you know, I, I would say that, uh, yes, it's fairly clear what's happening in the agrarian sector is, again, a story of conscious neglect over the decades. Uh, that's the story that we've seen in the agrarian sector. While the agrarian sector has remained the primary source of uh, employment livelihood for most of the people, the majority of the population. And it's a story of neglect, how we have uh, done away with the entire agrarian infrastructure. That's one. The second trend I think which is important is part of the larger neoliberal design. I talked of how we are looking at uh, a privatization of education and health. But what we are also looking at is privatization of natural resources which is essentially land, water, and forest. And that's, that's hap happened in a big way. And these farm laws were in many ways a, a very big step towards that. Uh, but that's where I think it was remarkable that the farmers of this country were able to uh, stay strong and push back and push back so hard that they have won a massive victory. So, you know, they have again inspired us. They, they have rejuvenated uh, uh, so many of the social movements in this country. And that's what I think we, we need. Can we also create the way they defended uh, their rights? Can we also create a movement for, uh, for right to health? Can we create a movement for what we have as the right to education? But we got the right to education, but if you look at the compliance data, uh, we are also part of the uh, RT platform. It's 12 to 15 percent is the compliance of the right to education. So how do we get a robust implementation of uh, right to education? So it, this year, the, the 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 workers' movement again. It was so painful if you remember even the timing when the migrant crisis was happening uh, year before last. That is the time when several of the state governments were doing away with labor rights, their rights to even unionize, uh, rights which they had won uh, after battles of, of decades or probably centuries. 
So you know, how do you also re-energize the 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 the, the labor movement? So th those are really that's the inspiration I think I take uh, uh, from all this work. You know, the second is for people like me and and some of uh, the people who might be here that we need to always be humble and be conscious that our contribution is at best coming out with these reports. Ultimately, it's these citizen-centric, people-centered movements which can uh, change. Uh, and we can you know, aid that through some data, but it is gonna be, all our work has to be invested in building the people's power. That's, that's what I, I would say. Uh, thank you, um, Amitabh. Uh, yeah, there is a question here on on minimum wages. Um, uh, yeah, uh, how about regulating maximum wages? Uh, uh, so this is a question because income inequality. You also mentioned about the income inequality. How yeah. there are some people's incomes are just hitting the roof, while uh, you know e even though government sets minimum wages and so on. Uh, still people are not paid the minimum wages uh, and even the minimum is not a living wage. So uh, so something uh, must be done about that. So th there's a question on that. What do you have to say on that? Yeah, you know, so I, I, I would certainly agree. And on a lighter note, if those people who are paid 40 crores a year are taking guidance from some godmen sitting in Himalaya uh, through emails, uh, then, then certainly yes. But, but uh, even if we leave aside what's happening today at the National Stock Exchange, what we have been reading in the newspapers, I think it's it's an it's an extremely important point. And then let let me again say that what Oxfam persistently says, and and this is important in the public discourse, that the the growth of billionaires or creation of billionaires, or now what we are, you know, again and again talking of the new unicorns that we are seeing, is actually a sign of failure. It is not a sign of success. I think in the public narrative, we need to bring that up. If you have 84% people losing uh, uh, wealth, uh, losing income, how can you celebrate that now we have the top two richest in Asia, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a sign of failure. Let's acknowledge it and let's start working with, with, uh, uh, with this reframed understanding that uh, billionaires is not a sign of success. And in terms of you know, the wealth tax, I do think, you know, and particularly for a group like this, uh, when, when I go to uh, speak on these issues with uh, academics or even the the, the, the rich people themselves, I don't often bring in the argument, although that's really the most important underpinning, is the moral argument. As in if people are sleeping hungry, how can people live in super yachts? That's the point. And, and therefore this, this point of, can we have a wealth line? The way we have a poverty line is bang on. But that's, you know, I, I think that that means a lot of work uh, in terms of the public narratives and, and even imagination. So bang on, radical idea, but but we need to work on it. Yeah, um, it's come, uh, keeping to the taxes, uh, um, I mean, it is, uh, you have mentioned that uh, there's need to tax the wealthy, but uh, means what we see, as you uh, mentioned, more and more the trend is that uh, on indirect taxes, that means all uh, more 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 and more common people are uh, taxed. If the government is uh, going ahead with this approach, and this is the trend, uh, so what can we do? So th this this one, uh, Denzel, I I would say as in that that's for all of us to collectively think, because the answers lie at. Uh, you know, the, the answers are gonna be similar. Uh, I can, you know, in, in a shorthand say that let's do what the farmers did. Uh, that's one way of, of, of uh, articulating the response. But the response has to be at multiple levels. One is puncturing 
this narrative of this kind of economic trajectory leading to prosperity for all and it's interesting that several people have started write, writing about the trick the failures of the trickle down theory it's important otherwise there's still many people who will just say that increase the pie and things will be all right you know this this whole even even our prime minister recently said oh we have to celebrate the wealth creators even he didn't say but i'm saying that even if it means concentration of wealth at the top level it's it's you know i think it's it's the morally obnoxious that last year we saw the rise of vaccine billionaires when the majority in africa we still have only 20% people who have been vaccinated it is essentially for profits that we do not have people vaccinated in africa so this this should be uh, not all right but multiple levels of work reports like this work like thomas piketty which are puncturing this argument that this is not working working with a whole range of actors like i talked of the 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 patriotic millionaires who understand that this is this is not all right but also ground level mobilization uh, for education for health which are drivers uh, of, of equality so it is it's ultimately going to be a, a a range of actions we can certainly make um, very specific demands around uh, taxation the tax structure but we've also seen that uh, as in denzel you certainly know that for years i've been working with the center for budget and governance accountability and we keep making those requests with solid arguments data coming from the government but i don't think that it's going to move just by those arguments it is going to be a uh, uh, people's mobilization so in you know a lot of my responses i'm going back to this understanding you know and and this is probably for this group i can say that that we as civil society developmental actors probably put too much weight on uh, advocacy and you know the 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 good old 60s 70s work that you know particularly many of your groups have done brilliantly well of organizing and mobilizing we kind of felt that we can short circuit that and just do good arguments use the media and make change happen that does not happen so we have to invest in organizing and mobilizing in a big big way yeah uh, thanks amitabh I, personally i just want to um, uh, ask a question and this is with regard to uh, the uh, number of uh, uh, collapses of uh, financial institutions and so on this abg shipyard and so on so on on the one hand uh there are people taking uh thousands and lakhs of crores of uh, loans from uh, banks and so on and the the banking system is uh, totally collapsing and people who have invested their hard earned money uh, uh in these uh, banks they are uh, unable to uh, get their money and not only that the uh, laws that are made are uh, such that uh, you know you uh, you will get only 5 lakhs if you uh, at the end of it so uh so i mean this whole uh, architecture of laws with regard to investment and taking loans uh, and uh, protecting the investors is uh, is almost collapsing and this is also uh, uh, in my opinion also creating uh, inequality Uh, those who are investing they are not getting uh, their money back if the banks collapse while those who are just uh, you know looting by taking loans they just uh, go abroad or just run away and uh, leave the whole financial system in, in shambles so um, so this is another area of uh, concern yeah no absolutely i i agree as in i i'll not be able to comment on the the detailed regulatory framework but in essence what you're saying is what we've been seeing so regularly every uh, few months you actually from starting from whether it's a nirav modi or whether it's a vijay malaya or now the amdabad uh, shipping uh, scandal it's the same story again and again of 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 non performing assets of of people just siphoning off resources uh, 
in, in a massive way. And the numbers are, are uh, mind blowing. And whereas, you know, just, just to kind of juxtapose that with, with the, the number of farmers who had to commit suicide because they had taken loans. I think that's that's also uh, important, and and with that maybe you know just one thing that uh, is slightly off tangent, but just remembered, uh, Denzel, that you know uh, this the the data which collected the farmer suicide thing had been discontinued three years ago. Uh, I think it's also important to just bring back the fact that we are not even getting the right data now. In many ways. Uh, you do not have the real numbers coming out. You know, the whole data systems have been changed, which is also worrying. Uh, because all said and done, the India data systems had huge inadequacies, but they were still robust to give you a reasonably good understanding of what's happening. And now we have to again and again go back to a CMIE data for what's happening with unemployment. You know, others are bringing out that data. Uh, so it's, it's important also to you know, keep focus on, on whether it's an ETIO, keep ensuring that they have to come out with uh, regular and reliable data. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, even the census is not uh, conducted as yet, so we do not know <laughs> what data will be, we will be left with. And uh, I, that I hope is just because of the COVID. I hope that they'll do it this year. So, and we do not know how reliable that will be also. So, um, yeah. Uh, so I think uh, um, uh, we have come to the uh, end, unless uh, anyone, um, Dr. Vinay Raj or uh, um, Dr. Vincent Raj Shaker, uh, unless you want to say something or ask a question or final final word before we just conclude. Okay, uh, so um, Dr. Archana, is Dr. Archana online? I am here. Okay, ah, yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay so okay. Uh, somebody is speaking? Yeah, okay. So shall we conclude, uh, Dr. Vinayaraj? Uh, you, are, you, are, you are muted, so. Uh, you can go. We can go for the vote of thanks. Thank you, yeah, okay, Mr. Okay. Abhidab, for the wonderful Thank uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Very informative. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Amitab, for these uh, for addressing all these questions. There are, you know, this is a huge topic, and uh, you know, I, we don't know how things will unfold, and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank uh, you especially uh, the Oxfam India team uh, in the future and continue the good work that you have been doing and inspiring us uh, in the civil society. I uh, now hand over to Archana who has, uh, Dr. Archana Sina. Yes, I'm here, I'm here. Yes, you can give Thank your you. concluding remarks. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Amitabhji for your wonderful lecture. Now, now the, the session, session is coming, coming to an, an end. end. We, we had, had a very interesting interaction, discussion session, session also. also. I would, I would like, like to, to invite, invite Reverend Arvind Peterji, Program Coordinator of Christian <coughs> Institute for the Study of Religion and Society, Delhi. And I request you to kindly deliver your formal vote of thanks. Arvind Ji. Okay. <clears throat> I would like to express my gratitude to all esteemed friends at this evening meeting for your presence and contribution. On behalf of Christian Institute for the Study of Religion and Society, Bangalore and Indian Social Institute of Delhi, I express my gratitude to our honorable speaker, Mr. Amit Behar, the CEO of uh, Oxfam India, for sharing his insight on economic disparity while giving us factual evidences and warning against the future economic crisis in our country. It is very serious to note that one thing I have noted that 21,000 people die in a one day, one person every four seconds. 
we are in a very grave situation and thank you uh, thank you uh, amitabh sir for bringing out such a data and uh, you know telling us all these things thank you so much for uh, taking out time from busy schedule thank you so much sir thank you i express my gratitude and thanks to dr denzel fernandez the executive director of indian social institute delhi for moderating the webinar so meaningfully thank you my father for your support or contribution towards this evening meeting thank you father i thank our director dr yt vinaraj for his guidance and encouragement to coordinate and hold this meeting benefiting the ecumenical leaders pastors and clergy as well i am thankful to dr archana sinha a senior research fellow senior research fellow on gender justice and development in uh, indian social institute uh, thank you ma'am for uh, leading this uh, evening webinar thank you so much my sincere thanks to all our ecumenical friends and clergy who took out the time and contributed to this meeting thank you all A special thanks to our technical team in bangalore for the technical coordination in managing zoom this evening thank you so much once again i thank you everyone for being with us throughout this evening god bless each present thank you and good night thanks a lot